Well, it seems like the year has just flown by. It doesn't seem like that long ago that we were getting ready to start the meetings with uh, Dr. Stevens, right? Um, I don't know what happened to the year, but it's been a, it's been a fast one for sure. Here we are at Thanksgiving time, and um, you know I, it's interesting. In my devotional, I found something I thought I would share with you this morning. It's in the Gospel of Mark, and uh, you know the the Gospel of John. In John uh, it, one, it tells us that all things came into being through Jesus Christ, Amen. and it tells us who He is. I, I always say that that you don't understand Christianity if you don't know who it is that you're worshiping. And we worship as Lord and Savior, the one who brought us into existence. Everything in, came into being through Christ. But in Mark's account of the feeding of the 4,000 in Mark 8, it tells us this in, in verse 6. It says, So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and did what? He gave thanks. He gave thanks. He gave thanks, broke them, gave them to his disciples to set before them, and they set them before the multitude. So, the one who brought everything into existence and took upon himself human form, came to this earth, and he gave thanks. Later in chapter 14 of Mark, verse 23, when Christ is instituting the Lord's Supper, it says something very similar. Mark chapter 14, verse 23, it says, Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. So here it is again, that Christ himself gives thanks. While Christ was one through with the Father throughout eternity, he came to live among us and to teach us by his example how we are to live for him in the world. Now, many make the mistake of looking at the humanity of Christ and uh, the humanity that he took upon himself, and they think that he is defined and limited by that humanity. I've known people who reject the idea of the divinity of Christ because you see the pictures of Christ being subservient to his Father in the New Testament, and of course he is. He came to teach us what it means to live for, for him. He's trying to give us the example of obedience and faith in the Father. He came to teach us how to live life with a heart of thankfulness. And so Christ is always acting in such a way to teach us how we are supposed to be. You know, it was Abraham Lincoln that in 1863 instituted the national holiday of Thanksgiving. Kind of an interesting time for it to come into existence because the Civil War was still being fought at that point in time. But I want to suggest to you that for the Christian, no presidential proclamation should be needed for us to gather in a spirit of thanksgiving and praise. Wouldn't you agree? The Word of God tells us that to enter into the presence of God is to enter with a spirit of thanksgiving. Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is, the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and we are not our, our, ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. You know, Psalm 136 gives us the basis for our thanksgiving in the refrain that is repeated all throughout the entire psalm. Verse 1 says, O God, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his, what? His mercy endures forever. O give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. O give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. And from here on, it begins to recount the blessings of the Lord on his people, Israel. His deliverance of Israel from Egyptian slavery, his, his overthrowing of the armies of Pharaoh. But at the end of every stanza comes the refrain, for his mercy endures forever. And that should mean something to us. In a world condemned to death because of sin, those redeemed by the mercy of the Lord have reasons for thanksgiving and rejoicing. Thanksgiving is a theme that seems to be emphasized over and over again in the New Testament. In Luke 17, Jesus heals the ten men with leprosy. But only one returns to give him thanks. That one was a Samaritan. 
And Jesus responds with these words, were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. Now Paul, writing to the Philippian church, at a time when believers were still suffering for their faith, writes this in Philippians 4. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You understand that the church at that point in time is being persecuted. They're facing death for their confidence in Jesus. And yet, even in times of want and trial, they are to be thankful. You know that I believe that it is the spirit of thankfulness that binds us most closely to the heart of our Savior. Thankfulness in times of difficulty is the ultimate expression of faith and confidence in God. It is this that marks a person's heart as genuinely belonging to Jesus. In contrast, we live in a world that is marked by a spirit of entitlement. Paul, when he was writing to his young friend Timothy, warned of the conditions that would be present in the last days. And in, 2 Timothy, in 1 Timothy 3, he says this, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. What's the next one? Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Now covetousness, boasting, pride, blasphemy, we get the seriousness of all of those sins. But the one that is interesting is unthankfulness. It's sandwiched into the list as one of the sins that will prevail at the end of time. Every breath we take, is a gift from God. Every time we are able to get out of bed in the morning, and there's sometimes when the weather's cold and you're a little stiff like I was this morning, it's a little harder to get out of bed. But every time we do, it is something that none of us deserve. And yet sometimes we live life as if we are entitled to everything. We forget that God is not obligated to give us anything, and yet we expect it all. Now, don't misunderstand me. God is one who loves to give us gifts. You know, as every parent loves to give their children something special, God loves to give us gifts. In fact, Desire of Ages makes this interesting comment. It says this. It says, looking unto Jesus, we see that it is the glory of our God to give. Have you ever seen that statement before? It is the glory of our God to give. I do nothing of myself, said Christ. The living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. I seek not mine own glory, but the glory of him that sent me. In these words is set forth the great principle, which is the law of life for the universe. All things Christ received from God, but he took to give. Let me catch up here. So in the heavenly courts... In his ministry for all created beings, through the beloved Son, the Father's life flows out to all. Through the Son, it returns in praise and joyous service, a tide of love to the great source of all. And thus, through Christ, the circuit of beneficence, or love, is complete, representing the character of the great giver, the law of life. God is the great giver. He loves to give gifts. It's our self-centeredness that make us think that we deserve all of those blessings. And so we grumble and we complain when we don't get what we want or expect. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul writes these simple words. He says, Rejoice evermore, pray without, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything give thanks. In everything? I don't know, some things don't feel like something that you would want to give thanks for. It's kind of a hard concept to comprehend, isn't it? But I'm reminded of Paul in Romans 8, 28, where he says, 
and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are to those who are called according to his purpose. It isn't all good things work together for good. It's that all things work together for good. Whatever comes in life, good or bad, no matter how hard it is, the Lord will make it turn out for good for us. We, if we have the confidence that the all things will be worked out for our eternal best, then we have reasons to rejoice, don't we? We have reasons to be thankful even for the hard things that come. I believe that it's the voice of thankfulness is a praise that is especially precious to the heart of the Lord. In Mark 11 is recorded the second time that Jesus changed, chased the money changers and overturned the tables in the temple. Three and a half years earlier, Christ began his ministry by cleansing the temple. The beginning cleansing and the latter cleansing of the temple is a reminder that only God can clean the heart. But in fact, Christ will, would cleanse the temple even at the end of his ministry, which is in many ways a reminder that he that has begun a good work will bring it to completion. He began his work by cleansing the temple. He concluded his work by cleansing the temple. He begins his work in us by cleaning our hearts, and he continues that work, cleaning our heart until the very end when he comes the second time. It's not, the work of Christ, it's not only the work of Christ to begin the work of salvation in us, but it is his, his work to complete it. He begins the work in us, and through our faith in him, he continues that process until he completes it and gets us ready to go home. Desire of Ages, in describing the first cleansing of the temple, uses words that I find that are significant. The first cleansing of the temple is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 2. In this account by John, Christ does something that seems out of character for him. He binds together a set of ropes and makes himself a scourge and raises it above the heads of, of those who are buying and selling in the temple, threatening to use it on them. And he chases the money changers out, he chases the animals out, he overturns the tables and, uh, and, and chases everybody out. And John says the disciples would recall the passage in the Old Testament that says, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Now, Desire of Ages describes the reaction of the religious leaders. They, along with everyone else, has been chased out of the temple. And here's what Desire of Ages says about it. If you don't mind, if I, there's a few paragraphs I want to share from you, share from Desire of Ages with you, because I, I think they're incredible statements. It says, slowly and thoughtfully, but with hate in their hearts, they return to the temple. But what a change has taken place during their absence. When they fled, the poor remained behind, and these were now looking to Jesus, whose countenance expressed his love and sympathy. With tears in his eyes, he said to the trembling ones around him, Fear not, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me, for this cause came I into the world. The people pressed into Christ's presence with urgent, pitiful appeals. Master, bless me. His ear heard every cry. With pity exceeding that of a tender mother, he bent over the suffering little ones. All received attention. Everyone was healed of whatever disease he had. The dumb opened their lips in praise. The blind beheld the face of their restorer. The hearts of the sufferers were made glad. As the priests and temple officials witnessed this great work, what a revelation to them were the sounds that fell on their ears. The people were relating the story of pain they had suffered, of their disappointed hopes, of painful days and sleepless nights when the last spark of hope seemed to be dead. Christ had healed them. The burden was so heavy, one said, but I have found a helper. He is the Christ of God, and I will devote my life to his service. Parents said to their children, He has saved your life. Lift up your voice and praise him. The voices of children and youth, fathers and mothers, friends and spectators, blended in thanksgiving and praise. Hope and gladness filled their hearts. Peace came to their minds. They were restored soul and body. They returned home, proclaiming everywhere the matchless love of Jesus. What an incredible description of what was taking place. <clears throat> in describing the second cleansing of the temple, very similar language is used. 
It describes what the religious leaders met when they came back to the temple. They heard the voices of men and women and children praising God. They saw the, the sick healed, the blind restored to sight, and the crippled leaping for joy. They were rejoicing because Jesus had healed them. He held the children in his arms and received their kisses of affection, and some of them had fallen asleep in his arms as he was teaching the people. Now with glad voices, the children sounded his praise. They repeated the hosannas of the day before and waved palm branches triumphantly before the Savior. The temple echoed and re-echoed with their acclamations, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord, and behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. Hosanna to the son of David. Now, the interesting thing is, is that the word worship is not used in Desire of Ages when it recounts either of these events. But these statements provide the most perfect definition of worship I've ever read, ever read anywhere. Because to me, that's what's happening. They are praising and, and expressing their gratitude and their thanksgiving and their honor to Jesus. True worship, do you understand, is people gathering together to give expression to their thanksgiving and their gratitude to the creator of all things for his incredible blessings. That's what worship is. That's what worship really is. You know, what I can tell you without any hesitation is that in spite of our guilt and sin, we are deeply loved. Christ came to give his life as a ransom for you and I. We have so much for which to be thankful. Our lives ought to be filled with praise and thanksgiving. You know, it's interesting. According to the book of Revelation, thanksgiving is going to be a part of our life, even in the world to come. Revelation 7 talks about the 144,000. And it's interesting because I've had people through the years who've tried to define for me who the 144,000 are, and I always point them to the spirit of prophecy statement that says, we shall all soon know who the 144,000 are, you know. But I always tell everybody that I'm more interested in the great multitude that is in that same passage, because that's where I suspect I'll be <laughs> somewhere, hopefully, in that great multitude that no one could number. And then in verses 11 and 12 of, Rev of Revelation 7, the angels break into song. And here's what it says here. It says, All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. It is here in this life that we practiced to join the angelic hosts in their songs of praise and thanksgiving. We practice it here by learning to offer thanksgiving and praise to the great giver of gifts now. It is our, our thanksgiving and praise that we offer to the Lord that helps us to be ready to be a part of that great course in heaven that sings glory and honor to the name of Jesus. I thought we should practice. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You want to practice? Say it with me. Amen. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Do it again. One more practice. Amen blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It is here that we learn how to practice praising and thanking God and glorifying his name for the life, for the gift of mercy that he has extended to us and the gift of salvation through his son Jesus. We learn here and now how to give thanksgiving to the Lord. We don't need a presidential resolution to create a day of thanksgiving in order for us to bow in thanksgiving and praise to our God, do we? Father in heaven, I bring this group of people to you. 
And Father, we want to praise your name and offer glory and honor to you and thanksgiving for such incredible gifts. Father, we thank you and praise you. We don't deserve anything, but you've given us everything in Jesus, your son. Father, we praise you and we thank you and we honor you and we glorify your name in Jesus' name. Amen.